So I'm Philip, uh, and what I do, uh, so I'm co-founder of Vistorfront, as you heard, and just for the statistics, please raise your hand. How many of you know Vistorfront? Oh, nice. I had no idea we have such reach in Canada. So for those of you who don't know, it's a headless progressive web app frontend, which is backend agnostic, which means no matter which plat e commerce platform you're using, you can connect it to view storefront. Uh, and it's also free and open source project, so if you like it, you can give us a star on GitHub or some shout out on Twitter, whatever. I'm also a senior developer in Divante, uh, and I'm also a blogger. Uh, in View School. Apart from this, I'm a community partner of Vue.js, and when speaking about View School, you probably have seen it, but you can make a picture of this QR code, and you can have a one-month free subscription to View School with it. So I will leave it like for five seconds. Nice, most of you probably already took the picture. Okay, and for the sake of statistics, again, please raise your hand if you're using component library, even if it's a component library built by yourself, please let, raise your hand. Hi, hi, okay. Nice, like a half of you. It's really nice. Like usually I see maybe 10, 20% of people. So I hope I will convince the rest of you also that uh, it's really nice to use it and actually they're really awesome. And how awesome they are? Well, let's see. So with component libraries, we can, first of all, save a lot of time on creating repetitive UI elements. So every time you start a project, you're probably creating some kind of a button, some kind of a checkbox, every form elements, etc. you're doing it again and again and again. So if you have a component library that is doing just this, then you're saving yourself out of groundwork. Also, if we use component libraries across many projects in our company, we are highly reducing onboarding time uh, for these projects because when actually developer is moving from one project to another, they already know most of the UI. The only thing that they need to learn is actually uh, the product-specific logic, and this is a very, very, very nice feature. Also, with component libraries, we're reducing a lot of uh, component API design fatigue. What does it mean? It means that whenever we create a component, we need to think about the API for this component. We probably need to experiment with this because the first idea might be not the best one. So if we have a component library that has proven API, we don't need to think about this. Also, if you have a component library, we can test it once and then forget about this. So it's also very good for the code quality and also saves time. The same applies to the documentation. Usually, if you have a project, you don't have time to document every UI component. So if you have one component library that is either yours, like for company, or some public one, then you have very nice documentation, very nice taste. So generally, generally we can say that component libraries are helping us, us to deliver high quality components that are tested, documented, accessibility friendly, and have proven APIs. So generally, they are saving us a lot of time and letting us to build better uh, applications, yes? So, why not everyone uses component libraries when it's such a great idea? Like, at least half of you. So, my reasoning behind, be, behind this is that even though a lot of comp component libraries gives us a lot of uh, out of the box when we are starting the project, then the further we go, uh, the more we need to dig into it, the more we need to hack it, and they generally fail when it comes to heavy customization. And at some point of the project, instead of helping you, they behave like this. <laughs> this happens to me also, and this happens to us in a company. Okay, it's gonna be repeated, why not? Uh, this happened in our company also, uh, also for view storefront, so we decided, okay, Let's make our own component library with customization in mind as a primary goal. And this is how we create the Storefront UI. It's uh, also an open source project. Uh, it's a component library that is focused mostly on performance, customization, uh, and uh, it's very easy to use. And it's also for e-commerce. It's currently on beta, which means you can use it, but we can't guarantee anything. Uh, but also we can contribute and help us like this is it looks really nice This is like the out of what, what you can achieve with this out of the box uh, 
You can also give us a star. And if you would like to join us, we have a really, really nice team. Maya from our core team is also speaking on this conference. It's currently six of us, and also the whole company behind us. And during this talk, I want to share some, uh, our ideas, our thought process, and some lessons learned why we are building this library. And we are building it for almost a year right now. And as we all know, knowledge is power, so it's very important to share this knowledge. And the first thing that you need to know is that you can't satisfy everyone because it's all about trade-offs. Like I said, a lot of libraries face when it comes to heavy customization, but in return, they are very easy to upgrade, for example. So everything is about trade-offs, and we need to define the main project goals to know uh, how actually we should decide on these trade-offs. Give me a second. So, our project goal for Storefront UI was to make a customizable component library. But actually, this goal wouldn't help us in making any decision, so we need to be more precise. So, our goal was to make component library that can be used to code almost every design. And this is very important because this implies that we need to favor customization capabilities over other factors. Then, knowing this, we needed to find some possible usage scenarios of this component, so we took some designs uh, and we extracted some certain components from these designs, for example, some banners, some uh, product tiles, things like this. We have seen what are the differences and listed down the differences, and it turns out that usually it's typography and the colors, these are the paddings, margins, sizes of certain elements, of course, icons, sometimes it's also order of elements inside the component, and in very extreme cases, it's also a markup. We not all, always can adjust markup only with CSS. So the challenge here is we need to address those needs, but also keep ability to fix bugs uh, and add new features to our library without introducing breaking changes. So this is the tough thing. OK, I'm talking a lot, but we haven't learned anything. So yeah, you want the code, because this is tech conference. Wait a minute, just a minute and I will show the code. So the first thing that we need to know before I will show the code is that component library is essentially a design system because there are not only components in here. Components just are just a small part. We have also a style guide that plays well with these components, that influences these components, and both of them can be applied to some context. We need some animations, etc. So it all creates a full design system. So let's start with the style guide. What is a style guide? So, style guide is a set of standards for the writing, formatting, and design of documents. And if you want to apply this to web design, then those are usually colors, typography, things like this. Okay, so now it's time to show you the code. So, uh, we can represent style guide in a code as CSS variables. You can agree, we have colors, we have typo typography, etc. And this is what we did in Storefront UI. So we have a set of basic variables that you can change and then change the default style guide. So we can actually represent the style guide that you will get from your designer uh, in a form of these CSS variables. This is very easy. And we already covered the style guide. OK, but <clears throat> before we dig a little bit further, there is a very important question. Before we will dig into the components, we need to ask the question, what components actually we should create? What will guarantee that we have decent level of granularity, that the components are not too small and are not too big? So there is a concept called atomic design. Who knows atomic design? OK, so atomic design essentially is a design concept that tells that components should be divided into five groups. Fair, and every next group is a build up of the components from the previous group. So we start with atoms, which are very, very small UI elements, like single icon, single image, single text, etc. Then we build molecules, which are just a set of uh, atoms that have some context. For example, it could be the bottom bar, uh, it could be the uh, header, things like this. Then we organize those molecules into organism, which could be kind of a full context of, 
of, uh, of a given task. Like for example, here we have full context of image because we already have an author of this, we already have some interactions, we already have comments. Uh, also the sidebar is a full context of, of itself. Then we have uh, templates, which are just full pages. And we have pages, which are templates, but filled with the full context of the certain usage scenario. And if you want to learn a little, little bit more about atomic design, because this is just scratching a surface, you can uh, actually read this book by Brad Frost. It's free, as far as I know, so you can download this. It's called Atomic Design, obviously. Okay, so we know which components we should create to have a decent level of granularity. Then the question is how to make them customizable, because we already can customize only this client guide. Obvious answer would be for CSS. Who thinks we should do this for CSS? Okay, you're very smart. Barack Obama also thinks that we shouldn't do this. So, if you want to make components customizable, it's very good to think about some abstraction over their HTML and CSS structure, because if you will customize them through purely CSS, then CSS and HTML and HTML are becoming our API. And API is something that we need to maintain. It's something that we need to take care uh, into and into consideration when we are shipping changes. So actually, every change in HTML and CSS would become a breaking change if this would be our API. We don't want this. So we can create this abstraction over this. And of course, a decent level of abstraction over, uh, over CSS and HTML are as CSS variables, also CSS variables. So by doing this, we are actually limiting the scope of changes that user can apply, and we are directly saying what could be done and what couldn't be done. So we can't change, for example, float. We can't uh, change uh, things that are positioning uh, the button in the layout, but we can change some internals of this. Okay, some photos. So this is very, very nice public API based on only SAS variables, and we already can customize our components, and we can already customize our style guide. Okay, let's go to the icons, what we could do with the icons. Uh, where in storefront UI, icons are represented as JavaScript objects. They are SVGs, but not full SVGs. We only have viewbox and path. And this gives us a lot of possibilities. First of all, we can represent these icons uh, with a component called SF icon and refer to them only via their, their key. But what is even better, uh, since the SVGs are creating on the created on the fly from these partials, we can dynamically change colors of this, size of this, etc. What is even better, thanks to the fact that uh, JavaScript modules, ES modules are singletons, we can easily overwrite any of these icons. Isn't this awesome? I really like this idea was uh, from Maya Shavin, who will be talking tomorrow, and I really like this. So, okay, we already know how to customize things globally. This is really nice, but sometimes it's not enough. You can't reproduce every layout just with this. So, in some cases, you might need to change markup of your components, also order of child's elements, and usually to do this, you need to create a new instance of a default component, customize it, and use this instance instead of a default component. So the first and obvious way of configuring this uh, certain elements are uh, props. We use props every day. But the problem with props is, even though it's a very simple way of creating an API, uh, if we overuse them, it's just very, very uh, hard to maintain components that are highly overcomplicated. Also, in, we need to remember all this API. So I would suggest, and this is what we did in Storefront UI, to use props only for most common use cases. I'd say the ones that 80% of the users will use our component for. And for, for all the rest, don't cut them off. Let people do this but provide some general solution to do this that is maybe not so easy to apply as props, but will cover all the other use cases, like for example, slots. Uh, also, what I wouldn't advise, it, and what also we did in Storefront UI, is you shouldn't use props for applying purely visual changes because this is actually misleading people. Uh, with, if you have a prop color red, okay, we can assume that the only thing that it, this is doing is changing the color to red. 
but we have no idea if this is uh, changing some internal icons, if what class it is adding. It's just misleading people and makes debugging harder. So try to avoid st stuff like this. If you're making visual changes, use CSS. If you're making logical changes, use props. Also, good organization of your team page can really open a lot of possibilities. I highly encourage you to uh, divide your inner components or parts of your components, blocks, into standalone things, into standalone blocks. Uh, BAM methodology is very useful here. How many of you knew, know BAM methodology? Okay, also half. So it's a CSS methodology that, in very, very uh, short words, lets you uh, group your HTML into standalone blocks. Uh, then those blocks have elements inside of them, and every element has modifiers uh, that are also expressed as uh, certain classes. And this is very good for code organization templates, and if you will use HTML, our HTML like this, we can also wrap all these blocks into scope slots. And with this, we can actually replace any part of the markup of the given component. So this will open a whole lot of new possibilities to apply those components in different contexts. Let's have an example. So we have a pagination component. It looks like this. So it has some arrows, arrows as navigation, and some numbers. Let's say we don't like arrows, and we want buttons in here. So with an independent HTML blocks, we can, actually, we can easily change it uh, just by providing our custom HTML into given slot. And with slot scope, we can provide every needed uh, functionalities for this, uh, for, for this block to make it work. In this example, we are checking if uh, it's disabled, which means it's f if we are on the first page, of course, we can't go to the previous page. If we're on the last page, we can go to the, uh, to the next page. So this is, is disabled, and go is just going further or uh, to the previous page. So with slot scope, you can just provide everything that the markup might need, and then replace this markup. Also, uh, there is another advantage of using BAM and having these blocks that are contextless in our components, because if we combine it with Flexbox, then we can easily even reorder child elements. Here we have uh, SF button component from Storefront UI. We just have some class, some title, subtitle, and button text. Nothing fancy. But let's say we want to reorder subtitle and title for some reason. So if you're using Flexbox, it's very easy because we can do it like this. Uh, we can write a class and use the order uh, CSS property to reorder this. But it has some disadvantage. What disadvantage? It's exposing our implementation details, because right now it's tied to the way uh, that our HTML is structured to the CSS class names. So we might want to abstract this as well. So we know the way how to abstract this. We'll abstract this through SCSS variables. So we are just making our uh, scope of changes bigger. And right now we have everything covered. So we have typography, colors, paddings, margins, icons, order of elements, markup, everything. So Actually, there is only one question left. How to ship it? Uh, and <laughs> we basically have two options. The most common option is to ship it as a bundled code. And usually when uh, bundled code is just we have a bunch of files of the library and they are processed by a bundler, like Webpack, and it's outputting single file, like storefrontui.js. And usually in Vue ecosystem, when we uh, bundle things like this, we're exposi exposing it as a Vue plugin. This is an example of how we can achieve something like this. Uh, Vue use will run install uh, function, and this install function globally registers every component. This is very easy to use, but the downside of this is that if we have bundled code, we have no control over it as a developers later. So for example, if this code was bundled to support uh, Internet Explorer 10, and it ships a lot of polyfills, et cetera, and we don't want to support Internet Explorer uh, 10, those polyfills will still end up in our bundle, so it will make it bigger, so our page will load uh, longer. So what is the better approach? 
the better. Ah, also, downside of this is that no matter how many components we use, we can use single button. Everything will be added to our bundle. So all the components we end up with in our bundle and make our page load longer. If we use so-called raw source, which is just a source code of our project without any transp transpilation, uh, then we can fully benefit from all the, uh, all the features of bundlers like tree shaking, which is a dead code elimination. Uh, we can also uh, trans transpile it to the ES version that we want. And what is really nice that with this, if we, for example, uh, want only the arrow component, only this arrow component will end, up, will end up in our bundle. The downside of this is that browsers are not supporting natively either SCSS uh, uh, and uh, view files. So we can ship it as it is. We need some bundler in between that will transform view, view files, CSS files uh, into a production code. But this is not a problem really, because if we have a view application, we probably already do this. If you're using VCLI or Next or anything else, this will work out of the box. Just npm install import and it works. So we want to use raw source. Also the CSS variables of SAS obviously wouldn't work with bundled code because it's translated to a CSS. So I highly suggest using raw source and in fact, create a main current maintainer of Webpack, main maintainer, Sean Larkin, is also advocating uh, to use raw source. Okay, what else? There are some learnings that I want to share with you also. Like this was about customization and we already know how to make really customizable components. I hope you, you will be able to apply at least how half of this knowledge into your projects, maybe some parts. But with Storefront UI, we also wanted to print best practices into our components, because this also saves time. Like, every time you create a project, you probably need to figure to add library to support lazy loading of your images. So you can print such repetitive tasks uh, into your components, so whenever you use this library, you don't need to think about this, actually. And also, if someone will forget about this, they will still can benefit from it. So it's really, really good for code quality and for saving time. Also, I would avoid putting component CSS into a single global file. Instead, I would suggest having a style per component. It's very common in UI libraries to have uh, just a single, single, single SCSS file that has styles for every component. The reason uh, why they are doing this is that they are bundling JavaScript part, so it's supported everywhere and CSS part that needs to be customized because they are customizing only through CSS uh, is raw source. So it, it needs to be processed. But by doing this, no matter if you just use a button, we include whole CSS into our application. So I highly suggest to also divide your CSS per component. So if you like these ideas, then I hope you, I convinced you that you should build your, your component library, maybe for everyone, if you like, maybe only for your company, maybe for you, for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> even better, you can support Storefront UI. So if you like our ideas, we are currently in a beta, and we really need contributors, we really need exposition. If you don't want to contribute, of course, you can just give a star. But if you want to contribute, you can contribute code, documentation, help us launch this faster, you know, by uh, posting uh, motivational quotes on our Discord, etc. You can also join the core team. Uh, as you have seen, those are the amazing people. And if I would like you to take anything from this talk, is avoid repetitive work, work smart, not hard. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>